Hey there, fellow podcasters. Welcome to this week's episode of the Thriving Dog Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about a topic many of us are not so comfortable with, and that's dog cancer. I'm lucky today to have with me Dr. Megan Souders. She's a veterinary radi radiation oncologist for VCA Aurora Animal Hospital in Aurora, Illinois, and also a member of the Pet, Pet Cancer Care Alliance. Dr. Souders and her team are passionate about providing the highest quality of care for our pets, and I'm talking human level type of care here. They have a team of specialists and the most advanced technology available to give your dog the type of care that you'll find in human medicine. You can learn more about Dr. Souders and the team behind the VCA Pet Cancer Alliance at vcahospitals.com backslash vca hyphen pet hyphen cancer hyphen alliance, and be sure to follow them on Instagram where we are active um, they are at, at VCA, and of course, we are at Thriving Dog, and you can also subscribe to all our episodes at thrivingdog.co. Sign up for our email list. Every time a new, episodes, a new episode drops, we'll be sure to let you know. So, Dr. Megan, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, why don't you take a second to fill in anything I might have missed there, and we'll get right into things. Um, for the most part, I think you, you covered a lot of it. Um, I guess my, my biggest message for today that I wanted people to know about was that we have a lot of different types of cancer therapies available that are, like you said, human level, um, human grade medicine. Um, so even some, some things are even more advanced in, than in human medicine. So that's a, a benefit for our patients that we didn't really have before. And it's um, up and coming in veterinary medicine. Excellent. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people listening, you know, cancer is on the mind of, you know, probably every dog parent out there. Um, you know, the, the possibility that it could happen. And then if it does happen, what their options might be. And if they're going to a certain hospital or working with a certain vet, are they getting the best option? So really excited to kind of cover all the bases here um, since your expertise is so so deep, I think you'll be able to answer a lot of questions for our listeners there. Yeah, so a lot of animals are living much longer than they, they used to. So as we get older, cancer is one of the most common diseases that we, we can encounter in our veterinary patients. Um, so I always say the first thing is don't freak out. <laughs> I know it's a heartbreaking thing to hear that your pet has cancer, but if we you know take a moment to take a deep breath, and then go through the options. And I think another important thing is actually teaching my clients about the disease process um, so that they can understand why we recommend certain treatment options um, or why a treatment option might be best for their patient or for their, their pet. Um, just taking that moment to listen to it all and digest it is a, is a good first step. Um, but, you know, a consult with, an oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a surgical oncologist is, you know, our first step once we have a concern for cancer or a cancer diagnosis so that mm -hmm. we can go through all of the process. Okay. So maybe it would be helpful if we kind of painted a, you know, almost a, like a, a hypothetical scenario or, or use case of, uh, you know, kind of a typical um, sort of patient that you encounter. So let's say that Let's say that I, w I had a dog, um, you know, maybe a larger dog, 60 to 80 pounds, you know, it could be a German Shepherd or a Lab or a Golden Retriever. Um, let's just kind of take that use case, for example. Yeah. What, what might be a, a, a typical cancer, more common cancer that you would see in a, in a dog like that? One of the pretty prevalent types of cancers would be like a skin cancer. Um, a lot of those breeds especially will get like soft tissue sarcomas. Um, so those are a pretty common lump that they get in the skin, usually on the trunk or on a limb. And unfortunately, you can't just feel it and be like, oh, that's, that's maybe just a fatty tumor or, you know, it might be something more serious. You can't really tell just by feeling it. So, and it, it's, uh, and just to stop you real quick. So this would be a cancer that you can only feel or you'd be able to see on the skin. Also. Usually you see like a lump on the skin or feel it like if it's if they're a little pudgy you might feel it under some some fat on like their side or something like that but usually you can see a growth on the skin um you, usually still under the skin but something that you could actually see yeah. so you would see a raised area of skin but that area of yeah. skin might not necessarily be bruised or red or discolored right. in any way just raised 
Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So when we see something like that, first step is usually to try to do an aspirate of it, something called a fine needle aspirate. So you just take a small needle and try to extract some cells, squirt them out on a microscope and try to determine the cell origin. Okay. So these cell, these tumor types will often have a very distinct cell appearance and that can often lead you to a diagnosis of a sarcoma. Okay. Or other skin types, but or other skin tumor types, but that would be one of the most common ones we see in those breeds specifically, actually. Okay. Um, so anytime we are faced with a tumor, the first part we want to try to figure out is, is it just there or has it spread to any other parts of the body? Okay. Some tumors are more likely to spread than others. Um, so that's why it's important to get sort of that official initial diagnosis to kind of get a headway as to if this is a tumor type that spreads or if it's one that doesn't typically spread. Um, so first step would be poking it, like I said, and then the next step is looking for those signs of spread. Most common places, usually the lungs. So taking some chest x-rays mm. would sort of be the next step. Um, and as long as those look normal, then we try to figure out anytime we have a tumor, what is the best initial course of action and what might be follow-up actions that we would need to take for that tumor. So like if we have this tumor on a limb and we think it's a soft tissue sarcoma, we've determined we don't see any signs of spread. So we think is surgery the best option for this patient? Should chemo be considered or should we use something like radiation? For the most part, we're gonna try to use surgery first. We have a sort of a mantra, chance to cut is a chance to cure. Hmm. So we try to remove those if at all possible. Removal can sometimes be tricky when they're like on limbs, especially the further down the limb they go. Um, you don't have as much skin to close if you remove a mass. So sometimes you can remove it and still close the, the site primarily, um, like with sutures and things like that. But sometimes it's too large to be able to do something like that. So if you can remove it, that's great. And then we send them to surgery, we remove it and then submit that mass once you remove it for histopathology. Once we get the histopathology back, we're gonna look at what grade the tumor is, which tells us its likelihood of regrowth or spread. And then we're gonna look at the margins. So are there tumor cells at the edge of the tissue or not? And that helps us to also predict likelihood of regrowth for that patient. Um, if it's incomplete, so meaning they see tumor cells at the edge, or if it's a nice wide excision, then maybe we're done with that tumor. We don't need to ever worry about it again. Um, but in cases where we have disease left behind, so microscopic cells, that's it, then we might need to recommend for that patient to consider something like radiation therapy to kill those remaining tumor cells after surgery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm a, I'm a pet parent and my dog has, you know, some sort of growth like this, it's determined to be um, malignant, it's determined to be cancer. Cutting it out seems like, you know, pretty straightforward approach that just about any animal hospital would be able to do. So what are some of the more, what are some of the more, I don't know if they're, if obscure is the right word, but some of the other sort of treatments out there that might need to be um, used that pet patients or even other veterinarians might not know about? So for the, for the most part, for tumors like that, um, if, if we can't surgically remove them, if they're in a spot where removal is difficult, we can consider using radiation therapy first and foremost for that patient. Um, we can try to use radiation to reduce the size of the mass so that they could then go to surgery. Or if it's in areas where surgery is never going to be a possibility, we can use aggressive types of radiation therapy or even palliative radiation therapy if that tumor is causing the patient a lot of problems mm -hmm. to try to reduce the size of the mass and maintain their quality of life. So if we can't do surgery, then we can use things like radiation and chemotherapy in some cases to help reduce the size of the mass and keep them comfortable. And in terms of animal hospitals around the country here in the, in the U.S., um, to what extent are all of them able to do radiation therapy? So radiation therapy is a little fewer and further between. Um, like in the 
state of Illinois, there are only, I think, three hmm. hospitals that have radiation therapy. So I think in general, in the United States, there's only about 80 radiation oncologists um, in the college, and not all of them are even um, practicing. So there, there aren't that many radiation oncologists around. Hmm. So you may have to travel to get to one. Um, so that, that is sort of a downfall because there aren't that many of us across the country. Now, do most veterinarians, you know, your everyday vet vet down the street, does he or she know who to, you know, where radiation therapy can be done and whether or not it's, there's a specialist that, you know, a a pet parent can be referred to, to, you know, know if it's a good idea based on, you know, the pet status or not? Yeah, in in most areas, I would say yes. I think uh, a lot of them are pretty well educated as to what referral centers are near them and what they have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, so we've talked about um, cutting or surgical removal yeah. of a tumor. We've talked about radiation. What are some other treatment options out there? Um, chemotherapy would be another option that we have to treat um, a lot of different types of cancer. Um, it's not quite my specialty, but we still um, work very closely with the medical oncologist because um, a lot of times we need a combination of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy in some way, shape, or form. So um, we work very closely with the medical oncologist crew too. And if for some reason a patient can't have surgery or can't do radiation, then sometimes we can try chemotherapy to treat a tumor. Um, We also have a a couple of uh, immunotherapy type procedures that we can do. It's mostly with like melanomas, um, which usually happen like in the mouth of a dog. Actually, because that's a pretty common skin tumor in humans, but in dogs, it's more common to be seen inside of the mouth or like in a toenail bed or something like that. It's not very common to see it in the skin. Um, so we would use immunotherapy for those tumors. Okay. So quick question was, what is the difference between a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist? Mm-hmm. So a medical oncologist is um, an oncologist that treats cancer using chemotherapy. So you're basically treating the whole system to try to kill tumor cells that are either dispersed throughout the body, so more of like a systemic disease, um, or if you have a localized tumor, some of them will respond to chemo agents. So they use chemotherapy to try to manage a tumor versus a radiation oncologist is going to use a very fancy machine called a linear accelerator and we use high energy X-ray beams to treat tumors. One major difference is that we can really only focus in the radiation oncology world on localized disease. So it doesn't mean we can't treat dogs who have a systemic disease problem, but we can only treat localized tumor. Okay. We can't treat the whole body with radiation, but we can um, fine tune and focus our beam on a single site or a couple of multiple sites. (laughs) And you know what? So what are the some of the the pros and cons of of the radiation approach as opposed to chemo, for example, when uh, you know pet parent is weighing their options or when a vet is recommending what sort of protocol to follow. So anytime I see a patient, usually I'll I'll try to figure out what what are the owner's overall goals, and do those goals align with the actual behavior of the tumor as well. Okay. And in some cases, we know chemotherapy won't work or we know radiation won't work. And then vice versa. In some tumors, we know radiation is going to be our best option. And then and chemo could be the backup plan or something along those lines. So that's important to think about, too, when you're trying to decide which option is best for the, the tumor and, and which way will it align your goals with those owners. Um, when we irradiate a tumor, especially if it's like a a bulky tumor, so a a physical mass that you can see, or we know a physical mass is somewhere inside of the body. Um, One thing to always consider is that we're most likely not curing it. We're gonna be controlling it, and sometimes we can control tumors for many years, but it's unlikely that we will make it go away completely. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the same with a lot of the, the chemotherapy approaches. If you have a bulky tumor, the likelihood of making it go away completely is pretty low. So you can control it, reduce its size, but you won't cure it. Mm-hmm. And what about some of the um, 
you know, the more natural or holistic alternative approaches that you hear pet parents taking to treat their dog's cancer, whether it's, you know, ranging from, you know, essential oil therapy to raw food diet to acupuncture to all mm -hmm. of the above. Um, what's your thought or, you know, experience on some of those approaches? My major experience is that I don't strongly feel that they actually help to cure the cancer. I think a lot of those approaches can help to mitigate some of the side effects of the cancer, but I don't really think that they make much effect on the actual cancer. Hmm. A lot of the like diets and supplements and things like that that are out there are mostly antioxidants or, or rich in antioxidants. And those are great to help prevent cancer, but they don't do a great job at actually treating cancer. Um, so I don't push them heavily. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that interact with either radiation or chemotherapy. So sometimes we have to stop those if we want to pursue these types of treatments. Because mm -hmm. um, you give a dog a bunch of antioxidants and then irradiate it, you're kind of counteracting what radiation does at the cellular level. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have to stop them if we treat, but I have no qualms about them going back on those kinds of things once treatment's completed. Mm -hmm. And what about, you know, you hear this kind of simplistic uh, approach, simplistic, what's the right word, simplistic con conceptualization around how, how cancer actually works and that it's fueled by sugar. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if a pet parent were to remove um, high carbohydrate, glucose forming foods from their dog's diet, like most especially that found in, in mm -hmm. kibble, then that will, quote, starve the cancer and result in it you know not growing or receding etc for, for the most part we don't really see that kicking into effect until it's a pretty widespread disease um, to affect them metabolically and systemically so um, for the most part i don't really see much of that since as a radiation oncologist we're mostly treating localized diseases and a lot of my patients, they had it removed and were trying to clean up what's left behind. So the likelihood of there being enough cancer cells there to really switch your entire body's metabolism over to this glucose um, starving thing is, is, is pretty, pretty unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, so I, don't, I usually don't recommend changing diets or anything like that, especially when we're in treatment, because we don't know if they're getting sick then from diet or from a treatment or something like that. But um, for the most part, yeah, the, that's called the Warburg effect. Um, and to be honest, we really don't think it switches on until they get sort of a diffuse systemic spread of disease. And that's when we start to see things like cancer cachexia, where they start to lose their muscle um, along like their back or their head, they're losing weight, they're lethargic. Um, sometimes they'll still be eating, but losing weight regardless. That's when we think that's probably what's happening. Hmm. Once that happens, there's little that we can really do to control that. From no diet is going to fix that. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a I had a question that I was going to ask that I I for I forgot here. Um, so let's. You know, if you if, if someone is a pet parent um, and their dog is diagnosed with cancer, it sounds like well, what are some questions or other resources that they might be able to get their hands on that their veterinarian might not have? You know, almost kind of a way of, of giving a second opinion, so to speak, without getting a second opinion. Yeah. So they can always ask their vet to call us <laughs> um, and we can give them an opinion. Um, but if they've already got our opinion in one another one, then um, I mean, at some point in time, I think that Pet Cancer Care Alliance website is going to be a really great tool. They're working on a lot of information behind the scenes to be able to give owners information on different types of cancer treatment options, where they can get treatment, where maybe clinical trials are available, which right now the majority of clinical trials are in university settings, um, but there are a few Pet Cancer Care Alliance hospitals that will be able to interact with clinical trials too. Um, so at some point, I don't think it's quite there yet, because um, one of my technicians is on um, the Pet Cancer Care Alliance board, and 
she's helping to develop a lot of these behind the scenes things that they're going to be putting on that website. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think it's ready yet. Um, but trying to figure out ways so that people have all this information at their fingertips. And then when they come in for a consult, they already kind of know everything and have all these options available to them. Okay. And hi historically, do you have any sense or is there any data out there of what the, the rate of cancer in, in dogs, especially how it, how it maybe has changed over the last, you know, 50, 100 years. Do we have any sense for that? I think that we have like a statistic that says, you know, about half of the dogs over the age of 10 could develop cancer at some point in time. Some cancers are really serious and some of them are not as big of a deal, but still a big deal. <laughs> um, so there are some that can be pretty locally invasive and systemically invasive. And then there are some that are, behave a little less badly, I guess. Um, so they can be a little um, slower growing, less likely to spread, things like that. So um, I always think it's good to get all your ducks in a row and get all your answers about what kind of cancer your pet has and then determine if you know other diseases they may have might affect treatment or whether or not they should pursue treatment mm -hmm. based off of their age and other diseases and whether or not that tumor is ever going to become a problem for them. Got it. And so it sounds like your area of expertise and, and also that of the Pet Cancer Care Alliance is saying these are the different types of cancers that tend to occur in dogs. And mm -hmm. based on those, historically, we know what types of treatments tend to work best and which you know suite or collection of those right. might be additional ones for you to consider. Do I have that right? Yeah, correct. Okay. So maybe um, maybe what makes sense is you know, if we went down the list of maybe the kind of the top, uh, the top five cancers that uh, a dog is, is, that are the most common, and then, you know, the one to three treatments that tend to be the best for best approach to each of those, would that be kind of a good? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, so in, in dogs, I would say some of the most common um, tumors that we would see would either be things like lymphoma, which usually we treat with chemotherapy. There's not really any other treatments for lymphoma. Um, in other regions or other um, sites, nasal tumors and oral tumors in dogs um, are a pretty common thing that we can see. Um, nasal tumors, radiation therapy is the primary recommendation. In oral tumors, it's usually a surgery plus or minus radiation. Um, typically, we don't use chemotherapy to treat a lot of oral tumors or nasal tumors. Um, let's see what else. Um, some other pretty common tumors that like owners would pick up on would be like skin tumors. So most common skin tumors that we see would be soft tissue sarcomas, like we talked about, and mast cell tumors. Those are probably two of the most common ones that we see. Um, and for the most part, we always try to see if surgery can be our first choice. Um, if surgery is not an option, then we talk about radiation therapy and chemotherapy for those. Um, let's see, what else? In some of our large breed dogs, bone tumors are a pretty common thing that we can see. And, and those can be a little bit tricky because those aren't always something that owners can see um, other than limping or lameness associated with the tumor causing pain. Um, but most common breeds are going to be like the, the large breed dogs. Um, those tend to occur away from the elbow and towards the knee. Um, so those could be locations where they might see a slight swelling or notice that they're more painful at those spots. Um, unfortunately, that disease can happen in young dogs and old dogs. So that's something to also consider. Um, but for bone tumors, which the most common one is osteosarcoma, um, the standard of care would be um, amputation of the limb and follow up with chemotherapy. Um, if owners don't want to amputate or if um, the dog can't withstand an amputation, um, then we can do things like radiation therapy um, in an aggressive setting or a palliative setting to help control tumor and tumor pain, um, plus or minus chemotherapy. Um, that would be one of the 
more common ones that we see as well. Let's see what else. Um, an anal sac tumor is actually a pretty common tumor that we see. Um, most owners don't pick up on that one, but they might notice that they're scooting more or licking or something like that and think it's just like a irritated anal gland or something like that. But then that's why we do rectal exams on every patient. You have a finger mm -hmm. and you can be doing a rectal exam <laughs> on a patient, essentially is what we say. So um, if you feel like a lump or bump in that area, um, our typical protocol would be surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy to try to control that. Those are usually in such a bad spot that it's hard to get hmm. surgical margins on them, but removal of it can help to extend um, survival and response to treatment. Got it. Um, for cats, um, probably the most common things we see are lymphoma, which would be treated with chemotherapy. Um, otherwise, things like oral tumors in cats, uh, most common one is squamous cell carcinoma. And unfortunately, cats like to hide a lot of diseases from us or any ailments. So oftentimes they're caught pretty late, to be honest, because they're just so good at hiding everything from, from their owners. Mm. So um, oftentimes by the time we know it's there, really the only thing we can do is like radiation and chemotherapy to help with, with the pain associated with it. Cats don't tolerate surgeries like dogs do of the, the head. So um, they're a little more particular about having all of their pieces and parts than a dog is. <laughs> um, so that's one of the most common oral tumors that we see in cats and probably the second most common tumor that we see in cats compared Got to lymphoma. So the type of approach, it sounds like, really depends on <clears throat> the type of cancer. And like you said, whether it's, it's localized or more widespread throughout the body. So yeah. Lymphoma, for example, it's just, you know, bombard the body with, with chemo yeah. versus, uh, you know, a, a skin tumor would be a combination of surgery and radiation because it's much, it's much more localized. You got it. Yeah, exactly. And where does immunotherapy come into play? And what well, is immunotherapy? Immunotherapy, we don't have very many options for immunotherapy, um, but basically it's, it's, the main one that we use is um, for melanomas. Um, which is, like I said before, a type of oral tumor typically that we see in dogs, rarely in cats. Um, and so basically it's it's using a piece of like DNA essentially to look for its other piece in the body. Um, so it's sort of like a vaccine, um, but it's not a typical vaccine. So it's sort of searching out this certain receptor that it should it should see on a melanoma cell and then attack, uses the immune system to attack that cell. Um, and that's sort of the basis of immunotherapy is you're giving the body a piece, you want it to connect to another piece and then destroy that piece that it connects to. Got it. Yeah, my dad had a, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, over 20 years ago and had a, an experimental treatment at the time here at, at Stanford. Um, it was a vaccine, basically. And you know, he was cured. It's now an FDA-approved drug. So I was just yeah. curious to what extent those uh, that type of approach um, exists in the, the, the pet space. Yeah. Most of the other types of immunotherapies that are out there are clinical trial-based still at this point in time. So they're not really widely available or FDA-approved. Um, so we don't have that many of them available to us. Okay. So any, any thoughts on... Um, uh, I guess, you know, to what, to what extent are you familiar with the Golden Retriever Lifetime study and or, um, you know, along those lines, any thought on the potential risk, risk factors that, you know, raise and or can, can lower the likelihood of incidence of cancer in, in your dog? Yeah, um, with certain dog breeds, we know that they're very much so predisposed to, to cancer, like unfortunately Golden Retrievers are. Um, I mean, and that's, that's genetics and I'll be honest, I don't really think that timing of like spay and, and neuter are going to make a huge impact on the majority of the cancers that we see in certain breeds, um, like a golden retriever, because it's more so a genetic thing that's not really influenced by sex hormones. Um, I think spaying and neutering 
um, can have a big effect on certain developmental diseases or like orthopedic diseases for sure, but I don't think it has as big of an effect on cancer. Okay. What about environmental issues like, you know, pollution or drinking water or the type of food a dog is eating or all these kind of things that a lot of, a lot of folks in you know, the more natural and alternative space try to get a handle on and, and manage? Yeah. Um, well, we, we do currently, I'm sure that you have seen, um, have some potential issues with like grain-free diets um, and causing like dilated cardiomyopathies. Um, so not really cancer related, but it still is something to consider because it's not something, like if your dog can handle a grain, if it doesn't have a specific allergy to a grain, which most food allergies are actually protein related, not grain related. Um, like if you actually went through the testing and everything like that. Um, most dogs can handle grains. There's no reason they can't have a grain um, in their diet. So we don't really push for grain-free diets necessarily. Um, if you have a dog who you know is sort of predisposed to cancer, whether you know it's from its line or if it's a breed, then I, I don't think it's harmful to give them antioxidant-rich diets. It, it just we don't know if it will really make a big impact mm -hmm. overall or not. Okay, got it. Um, well, uh, anything that you feel like we didn't cover that we should have? Um, I'm trying to look through the stuff that they sent me to. I don't. I think that's everything. Are there any typical <laughs> questions that you get from for pet owners that you know we didn't really cover here? Um. I usually, I get asked about food a lot, actually, <laughs> and like all the supplements and antioxidants and things like that. So I, we covered that. Um, I guess, I mean, a lot of people always assume that their pet, if they have cancer, that they're in pain. And some of them are painful and some of them aren't. Um, but at some point in time, the tumors can become painful. Um, so think it's important that they have a continued relationship with either us or their family veterinarian to monitor that mass mm -hmm. what, wherever it is whatever it's doing to the body because sometimes it's not necessarily pain that causes them a deterioration in quality of life as a cancer process um, progresses it could just be what is the tumor pushing on that's causing a different type of clinical sign or is it starting to cause an electrolyte abnormality in the body that causes clinical signs. So sometimes just monitoring them and making sure we keep tabs on them, even if they don't elect to do advanced therapies, keeping tabs on them is still a really important thing to try to keep them as comfortable as possible. But that doesn't always mean pain medication. So it's not always a painful thing. It's just what is that tumor doing to their body? Mm -hmm. And can we give them some sort of treatment or supplement or something like that that might help with that? Okay. Like I get asked about that quite a bit too, like what to do if we don't treat. And I always am encouraging them to either continue to come in with me or their family vet to, to maintain everything. Okay. Well, Megan, anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's everything. <laughs> Where do you see the the um, you know the the future of uh, you know VCA Pet Cancer Care Alliance? What's what's the long term vision for that? What do you hope that that the the organization um, accomplishes? There's a couple things. So first, you know, having a, a big network of oncologists and radiation oncologists um, is really helpful. I know that the network of the radiation oncologists we we meet on a regular basis. We um, chat through teams about cases that we might be challenged with and get help from everybody. So it's it's nice to um, have like a, a support system um, and to be able to be like, hey, have you seen this before? And have somebody say, oh yeah, I saw this and this is what happened. Because um, sometimes we see things that are are extraordinary, um, very odd. So it is, it's nice to have sort of a, a backup system and a network of people that you can talk to at a moment's notice. So that's, that's really 
a great thing about the Pet Cancer Care Alliance. You have sort of multiple opinions from amazing people across the country. So mm -hmm. that's nice. Um, the other thing that I am pretty excited about is all the work that they're doing behind the scenes um, to create sort of standard of care for specialty medicine that we could then apply to general practices too. So that they know how to approach a tumor because mm. sometimes we don't get the greatest education, unfortunately, in vet school as to how to approach certain cancers. Um, so giving primary veterinarians the tools they need to approach a mass and educate their clients and know when to tap out and say, hey, you should probably see a specialist for, for this. I think that's um, something that the Pet Cancer Care Alliance is working on so that they, they know like, this is what all of the oncologists are thinking so that you could pass that on to your client before you send them over. Got so it. That part's pretty exciting. And it's, they're look, looking at standard care protocols for chemo agents, radiation treatments, and um, how to approach surgical um, procedures, all of those kinds of things. How did you work up patients' diagnostics that we would be recommending for them so that they have it all at their fingertips? You, we, I should have asked this earlier on, earlier on, but you, you mentioned, you know, there's some extraordinary or, you know, I don't know the word bizarre or, or, or yeah. what <laughs> you use cases that you're able to share with your fellow oncologists. Can you, is there one of those that um, you could paint a picture of for our, for our listeners? Um, so I never see like a, a simple tumor, unfortunately. So um, like for instance, today, what I've been working on is a treatment plan for a dog who has a thymoma, which is a, a tumor that arises in the something called the cranial mediastinum. So it's the space inside of the chest, um, like where your trachea lives, your esophagus, your blood mm -hmm. vessels, where your heart is kind of at. Um, they're typically benign tumors, but this dog is sort of filling its entire chest. Um, so they aren't usually this large. They aren't usually this invasive, but that is that is my approach <laughs> that um, I have to to come up with for for this patient. So, it, it I just see, I see sort of the the larger and more in charge tumors compared to what they're supposed to be <laughs> um, typically. So that that's sort of what happens here is we see some of the more advanced cases um, and have to try to treat the patients um, mm -hmm. without getting them uh, into sort of side effect um, profiles and things like that. Um, let's see what others recently. Um, we've seen some very odd like intrapelvic tumors. Um, so that's a pretty uncommon place for patients to get masses is in sort of in their pelvis um, arising from like muscles or something like that. Um, so those can be pretty difficult to approach because they're near a lot of very important organs. Um, so we've seen a couple of those just recently. Um, so those ones are a bit challenging because you can't usually remove them um, and nothing nearby likes to be irradiated. So that can be difficult. Oh, one second. I'll just one second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's one of our surgeons, Dr. Eva. <laughs> um, so those can be pretty challenging because um, oftentimes they don't respond to chemotherapy. Um, so we would be using radiation to try to control them and slow them down, but all the tissues nearby don't, don't like to be irradiated. Um, let's see. Um, one common one that we've been seeing lately is um, something called a tonsil or squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and the interesting thing about that is oftentimes they present actually for um, enlarged lymph nodes in their neck area. So it's like a, a cancer that arises from the tonsils like we have in the back of our throat. Oftentimes that tonsil is, is pretty normal in size and appearance, but that's where it starts. But what they'll come in for is like a, football-sized mass on their mm -hmm. neck that 
is really just a, is a lymph node that it's spread to. Um, so we, we've seen quite a string of, of those lately, but that's not a very common thing for, for us to see. Got it. So not all tumors are created equal and no. <laughs> they, they require their own unique approach. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right, Megan. Well, I think this has been great. Super helpful for our audience to, you know, hear all about, uh, you know, different approaches or at least, you know, the main approaches to, to um, cancers, especially some of the aggressive ones from an expert like yourself. So thanks so thank much you. for being on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. Okay, Dr. Megan Souders with Pet Cancer Care Alliance. You can learn all about her and the VCA Pit Cancer Care Alliance at vcahospitals.com backslash vca hyphen pet hyphen cancer hyphen alliance. And you can follow VCA on Instagram at VCA. Thanks so much, Dr. Megan. Thank you. Bye.